Welcome back, Highlanders, to the third and final lecture for Chapter 7. In this particular lecture, we're going to start off by talking about how to adjust for price changes. So there are two kinds of values I want you to start to recognize moving forward in your uh, academic careers. And the first of which is what we call nominal values. And those are values expressed in current dollars. So if you were to go to the movies and buy a movie ticket, and let's say the price of that movie ticket was $15, that is the nominal value of that movie ticket. It's the $15 that you paid for that movie ticket at this current point in time. Now, real values are values that have been adjusted for the effects of inflation or values that have been adjusted for the fact that prices change and in particular increase over time. So you might have had a grandfather at some point talk to you about how cheap things used to be. For example, they might say things like, back in my day, a movie ticket used to cost just maybe uh, 60 cents or something like that, right? And then you'd be like, oh yeah, Grandpa, well, how much did you get paid back then? And they might say, oh, well, you know, things were different. Back at that point in time, the wages that we might have got paid per hour might be, say, like, um, I don't know, 40 cents per hour. Right. So compare that to today, right? Yesterday, movie tickets are a lot more expensive. In fact, if you were to say, look at a movie ticket now, versus when your grandfather was buying them, a movie ticket now might be the equivalent of, say, $15. But if you were to look at your wage now, your wage might be the equivalent of $10 per hour. So if you're looking at these things, then you notice that it took your grandfather about an hour and a half of work to go see a movie. At the same time, nowadays, even though all those prices have increased, it also takes you about an hour and a half to go see a movie. Right, so the real price of the movie ticket in terms of how much labor it took you to go see it really hasn't changed, right? It just looks like it's changed because both the prices of movie tickets as well as wages have increased, right? So when it comes down to it, you got to be careful because otherwise you could be fooled in thinking that something's true when in reality it may not be true because we fail to adjust for the effects of inflation. Let's go through an example. If we want to take a look at the highest grossing movies of all time, if we look at this list in nominal values, which means that, again, it has not been adjusted for inflation, you'll notice that Avengers Endgame is the highest grossing movie of all time currently. Um, and notice that Avatar is number two, Titanic is number three, and so forth and so on down. Now, if you look at the years of which all these movies came out, you'll notice that they all pretty much came out after the year 2000, except for one of these movies, Titanic, which came out in 1997. Point being that they're all fairly recent movies when ticket prices are a lot higher. But think about what you're really trying to get at when you're trying to look at the highest grossing movies of all time. You're trying to figure out what is the best movie as measured by uh, the movie that sold the most tickets or had the most people go and see that. And if that's really what you want to try to figure out, then you need to adjust for inflation. Because if you don't, then it looks like these more recent movies are going to be the most popular movies and that the most people went to go see them because this is when ticket prices are higher. But back in your grandfather's day when ticket prices were a lot cheaper, right, their grossing values or the total grossing values of these movies isn't going to be as high even if the uh, more people went to go see them. So once you go and adjust for the effects of inflation, right, you'll notice that this list changes quite a bit. The highest grossing movies of all time in real values after you've adjusted for inflation is easily and probably always will be the movie Gone with the Wind, which came out in 1939, back when those movie ticket prices were a lot cheaper, right? But again, judging by the uh, estimated number of tickets back when those movie prices were a lot cheaper, it looks like this was the most popular movie of all time in terms of selling the most tickets. We can see that it sold far more tickets than the next movie on that list, which is Star Wars, which is now uh, labeled Star Wars 4, A New Hope, which is the original Star Wars that came out in 1977, which was a pretty groundbreaking movie at that time. Sound of Music is number three. E.T. is number four. The uh, Titanic, which came out in 1997, 
right, is actually number five on this particular list. So it makes the top five in both lists, right? But as you look down this list, you're going to see those kind of groundbreaking movies that you'd expect to be some of the most popular movies of all time. Uh, again, once you've adjusted for inflation. When you adjust for inflation, Avengers Endgame, which is number one on the previous list, is actually number 16 on this list and is one spot behind Avatar, which was number two on that previous list, right? So again, when you adjust for inflation, you get a more accurate representation of the number of tickets bought and sold to go see these movies, which is probably what you're really trying to get at when you're looking at the highest grossing movies of all time. So again, you got to be careful. You got to make sure you can adjust for inflation and look at real values versus nominal values. Otherwise, you can be easily tricked by things that you're going to hear represented in the media. For example, when a new movie comes out and they say it's the highest grossing movie of all time, chances are that is true in nominal values, but not necessarily real values. Right. In order to get across this idea, I'm going to uh, uh, show you a quick video clip here. This is another John Mustache Stossel classic where he's going to talk about how to adjust for price changes. So let's go ahead and take a look. The price of gasoline has risen again to a record high. What a burden for people. Gallon. The high prices are making it harder for some to keep their heads above water. They don't even put the price on the sign anymore. It just says, if you have to ask, you can't afford it. <laughs> Drivers aren't laughing. What do you think of the price of gas? It kills me. Too high. Too high. It's scary. It's going up and up and up, and it's the most expensive it's ever been. Actually, that's a total myth. Gas prices are lower than they used to be. Not that anyone will believe that. Would you believe me if I told you that the prices are lower now than they were 25 years ago? No, I, I wouldn't believe that. No, I don't think so. Just for inflation. It's cheaper now than it's been for most of the 20th century. I don't believe it. <laughs> it's cheaper now? No. It's really high, it's expensive right now. Record high gas prices. Another record gas prices. Continue to rise. How could they believe anything else, given the media coverage? Gas prices have hit another record high today. Record high gas prices shot up even more last week. Why do they all say it's so high? Because they're not adjusting for inflation. The U.S. Department of Energy says gas is actually cheaper now than it was through most of the 20th century. What costs more, gasoline or bottled water? Gasoline, definitely. Gasoline, of course. But no, the bottled water at this station costs three times as much per gallon. What about something sillier? What costs more, a gallon of gasoline or a gallon of ice cream? A gallon of um, gasoline costs more. It would have to be gas. Even more wrong. Gas may cost $2 a gallon, but buying that amount of ice cream here would cost nearly 30 bucks. And think about how much harder it is to produce gasoline. First, oil has to be sucked out of the ground sometimes from deep beneath an ocean or underneath ice or from the Middle East where workers risk their lives. And just to get to the oil means the drill must bend and dig sideways through as many as five miles of earth. What they find has to be delivered through long pipelines or shipped in monstrously expensive ships, then converted into three different formulas of gasoline, trucked in trucks that cost more than $100,000 each, and then your local gas station has to spend a fortune on safety devices to make sure you don't blow yourself up. Yet even after all that, gas still sells for much less than this water. But all we hear from the media is gas prices going up and up. All right, so obviously that is an old clip, but I still like to show it just because it does... Uh uh, show a message that is pretty consistent today, and that is the media will often report things as record-breaking prices or record-breaking profits, and it might be true in nominal values, but of course it isn't necessarily true in those real values or once we adjust for inflation. And another reason why I like to show that clip is because students bring up that it's an old clip and they like to look at the gas prices today and say, look how high these gas prices are. But again, if you control for the inflation that has happened since this video came out, versus um, uh, today, then you might see that, again, these gas prices, as high as they look today, when adjusted for inflation, aren't as high as they've been in the past. Right? So again, make sure that you control for inflation or adjust for inflation and calculating a real value before you start comparing prices across time. In any class that you take from here on out, whether it be economics or history or anything, if you're comparing prices across time, you should definitely be adjusting for inflation in order to compare their real values. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and talk a little bit how to do that. Now, before we can actually uh, calculate real values, we must first figure out to 
how to calculate a price index. So a price index measures the cost of purchasing a market basket of goods at a point in time relative to the cost of purchasing the identical market basket during an earlier reference period. So the idea is that if you're going to walk out of Walmart with a shopping cart full of goods today, how much would that cost relative to you walking out of that same walk Walmart with that same shopping basket full of goods, say 10 or 20 years ago? Right. So when we're calculating a price index, we're comparing the cost of the bundle in the current year divided by the cost of that same bundle in the base year, which is the year that you are comparing it to. So let's talk about, again, how to calculate this using an example. Let's say you're going to walk out with a typical basket of goods that consists of beer and liquor. So when you're calculating a price index, again, there's your formula. It's the cost of a bundle in the current year divided by the cost of that same bundle in the base year. And as you're going to see, this same is really important, right? So let's say that your uh, typical basket of goods in, say, 2010 consisted of, say, 10 uh, bottles of beer and five bottles of your favorite liqueur, right? So 10 bottles of beer at a price in 2010 of $2 per bottle is going to come out to $20 that you are spending on beer. And then five uh, bottles of liquor at a price of $16 per bottle back in 2010 means that you're spending about $80 on liquor. So if you add that up, your 2010 total is $100. So if you were to walk out of the liquor store in 2010 with 10 bottles of beer and five bottles of liquor in your basket, then the total on your receipt would be $100. Now let's compare that to say today or 2020. If the 2020 price of beer has gone up from $2 to $3 and the 2020 price of liquor has gone up from $16 to, uh, from $16 to $20, then what would our 2020 total be? Now people might say, uh, or as you're looking at this question, uh, you might be thinking, well, I don't have a 2020 quantity there. We don't need it because remember, again, we're talking about that same bundle of goods. So if you're walking out of the store in 2020 with the same bundle that you walked out with in uh, 2010, what would be those changes in prices? So you can just use that 2010 quantity, right? So again, if you walk out of the store in 2020 with 10 bottles of beer at a price of $3 per bottle, then that is $30 that you've been spending on beer. And if you walked out with five bottles of liquor at a price of $20 per bottle, then that is $100 that you're spending on liquor. So that's a total of $130 that would be on your receipt walking out of the store in 2020, right? So again, you look at the cost of the bundle in the current year, which is $130, divided by the cost of that same bundle in the base year, which is $100. And you get 1.3, right? Or in some cases, you'll see some textbooks, they always want to multiply it by 100 in order to get 130. So it could be represented as 1.3 or 130. Either way, that number means the same thing. That means prices have increased about 30% from 2010 to 2020 using this as our market basket of goods. So again, you're looking at this uh, increase in prices of about 30%, right? Our price index has gone up uh, um, or is now one, or our prices have gone up. So our price index is now 1.3 when we use 2010 as the base year. By the way, the price index in the base year is always equal to one, meaning that if something costs a dollar in 2010, then it would cost a dollar in 2010, right? So again, the prices are, in, are uh, the same, for uh, real values and nominal values if you're using the same year as the base year, right? But what this price index of 1.3 means is that if something costs you a dollar in 2010, then on average it's gonna cost you a dollar 30 in 2020, again, because that inflation has happened over that time period. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and talk a little about different kinds of price indexes out there. The first of which is called the consumer price index. And this is just the indicator of a general level of prices for consumers, where it compares the cost of the typical market basket in a specific period to the cost of that same basket in a different period. Basically, this is the index that we just calculated. 
right? And it's designed to measure the impact of price changes on the cost of the typical bundle of goods purchased by households. So things that households tend to buy, whether it be beer and liquor or diapers and toothpaste, right? Things that the uh, household will buy as things that are included in this consumer price index, typical bundle of goods, right? So again, it's kind of the index we just calculated and it includes a whole bunch of different things that households tend to buy. Now, if you're wondering who gathers this information about how much things cost now versus how much they cost in the past, well, if you work in a, uh, as a research assistant, as a graduate student in an economics PhD program, one of your jobs as a research assistant will be to go out to stores with a big price sheet and just write down the prices of goods so that economists can uh, input them in their computer and start calculating out these price indexes. In fact, that was the job that some research assistants had at West Virginia University when they uh, worked for the um, uh, research office there in the economics department. And again, it's not necessarily a fun job to do, but it's one of the things you do to earn your uh, uh, living stipend as a graduate student. Now, the other kind of price index that we're going to talk about is called the GDP deflator. And that reveals the cost during the current period of purchasing any of the items included in GDP relative to the cost during the base year. So this is going to include a broader uh, subset of items, whereas the CPI only included items that households like to buy, like again, beer, liquor, or toothpaste, or diapers, or things like that, right? The GDP deflator is much broader, and that includes capital goods and other goods purchases by businesses and government, right? So in other words, the GDP deflator will include those things like the beer and liquor and the um, uh, toothpaste and diapers, but it'll also include things like missiles and highways that governments like to buy, and it'll include things like um, conveyor belts or forklifts that businesses like to buy. Things that are not typically bought by households. So again, the GDP deflator is much broader and that includes uh, pretty much anything that is included into that calculation for GDP. So let's talk a little bit about the key differences between these two price indexes. So the GDP deflator, again, measures the price of all goods and services, whereas the CPI or consumer price index measures the prices of only the goods and services that are bought by consumers or households. So that's the one that we kind of just mentioned. And then the second one, and this is important, is that the GDP deflator includes only those goods and services that are produced domestically, right? Remember, it has to be produced within the borders of a country, the geographic borders of a nation, in order to be included into GDP. If it is produced outside of this country and imported into the United States, that is not added to GDP. So the GDP deflator won't include anything that is imported, whereas the CPI, or Consumer Price Index, can't. Right, so again, the consumer, the consumer price index can include those imported goods, but the GDP deflator will not. And then finally, the CPI is computed using a fixed basket of goods that doesn't change. Right, so again, it's the uh, cost of that uh, current basket of goods or that basket of goods in the current year divided by the cost of the exact same basket of goods in the base year. Right, and again, that basket of goods can't change. It has to be the exact same throughout time. Whereas the GDP deflator allows the basket of goods to change over time as the composition of GDP changes. So there are things that are going to be included in GDP today that wouldn't have been included as much in GDP in the past just because they didn't exist before. Things like iPhones or, or uh, smartphones or any other kind of new technology that's been invented. And again, uh, as that technology changes and our composition of GDP changes, that market basket of goods that will be used to calculate the GDP deflator will change with it. So what should we use? Well, it depends on what your goal is. Right? If your goal is to figure out how rising prices are affecting households, which is what a lot of research about rising prices are uh, centered on, then you definitely want to be using the CPI because, again, it only includes things that households buy, whether they buy them uh, domestically or from abroad. And, again, uh, it's the same basket of goods throughout time. So you know you're getting a pretty accurate measure there. Now, if you want to use an economy-wide measure of inflation, something that's much more broader, or how prices have changed for everybody, including businesses and governments, then you definitely want to use the GDP deflator, right? So if you're trying to convert nominal GDP into real GDP, of course you want to use the GDP deflator. If you're trying to figure out, again, how uh, households have been affected by inflation, then you definitely want to use the consumer price index, right? So let's talk a little bit about how to calculate real uh, values. 
In order to calculate a real value, you need to first know what the nominal value is, and then you need to know the price index for the year you are converting to, and then the price index for the year you are converting from, which is the year that you're comparing, say, the value from the current year to the uh, uh, base year, right? So with that in mind, here's what the equation looks like. If you want to calculate real GDP, as an example, real GDP is going to be equal to our nominal GDP multiplied by, on top of those, the price index for the year you are converting it to. divided by the price index in the year you are converting from. And what we mean by that is that, let's say that you're trying to take, say, 2019 GDP, and you're trying to convert it into, say, year $2,000 to see how much our production has changed from the year 2000 to 2019. Well, if you're trying to convert it into the year $2,000, you want to take nominal GDP for the year 2019, you know, multiply it by the price index for the year 2000, divided by the price index for the year 2019. And so what you're really trying to think of it is you're trying to think of these 2019s kind of canceling out so that you're left with real GDP, which is our nominal GDP for the year 2019, but convert it into year $2,000 or prices, right? So again, you want to put the year you're converting to on top and the year you're converting from on the bottom. So let's go ahead and go through an example. Now, again, this is really important stuff to know so that you can more accurately analyze the statements made by politicians or national leaders. So, for example, uh, when addressing the nation, the president declares that GDP was $200 in 2010 and that GDP was $500 in 2020. And so claims that our economy is producing two and a half times what it did 10 years ago. What he doesn't reveal is that these are nominal numbers and that the price index in 2010, which is the base year, is one, while the price index in 2020 is two. Evaluate the president's claim. Right, so again, if we're kind of looking at how to calculate real GDP, go ahead and set up the equation. So our real GDP for 2020 means that we're converting it into 2010 prices. In other words, if all the prices were the same in 2010 as they were in 2020, what would 2020's GDP really be? So in order to do this, this is going to be equal to our nominal GDP for 2020, and we're going to multiply that by our price index in the year 2010, which is the year that we are converting to, and we're going to divide that by the price index in the year 2020, which is the year that we are converting from. And again, the way to think of it is that these 2020s are going to cancel out so that you're left with our real GDP in 2010 prices. Right? So let's go ahead and plug in these numbers. In order to do that, I'm going to go ahead and leave the full screen mode so I can use a different color. Make it a little bit easier for you all to see. Right. So the numbers that were given to you in the problem was that the nominal GDP for the year 2020 was $400. I'm sorry, uh, $500. And that the price index and the base year, or the year for, uh, 2010, is equal to 1 and the price index in the year 2020 is equal to 2, right? So it's 500 times 1 half, which is equal to 250. So it is true that our GDP has increased in the last 10 years from $200 to $250, but of course it is a very uh, exaggerated claim 
that it has increased two and a half times what it did 10 years ago. That's true in nominal values only, right? Given the fact that prices have also doubled over this uh, time period, our GDP really only increased by about $50 here, right? So again, the president might make this claim, maybe because it's getting close to election time. He wants to show you how productive the nation has been during his tenure as president so that he can get reelected. But in reality, when you uh, control for these price changes by calculating a real value, you can see that these claims are quite exaggerated indeed. Right. So again, it's important that you understand how to calculate for real values uh, so that you can kind of uh, analyze and make sure you understand what's going on with these statements made by our nation's leaders. Right. All right. So that's how you calculate a real value. Please make sure you know how to do that for a quiz or exam. So you might have to be, have, you might have to calculate a price index, and you might also have to use that price index to calculate a real value. Now, if I tell you that a year is the base year, but I don't give you the price index in that base year, then again, you have to know that the price index for a base year is always equal to one. Right? Again, that means that just one dollar in 2010 is equal to one dollar in 2010. Now, if the price index in 2020 is two, using 2010 as a base year. That means that the uh, one dollar in 2010 is actually the equivalent of two thousand, or sorry, the equivalent of two dollars in the year 2020. All right, so again, make sure you kind of know what these numbers represent. All right, so let's talk about some limitations of GDP. So gross domestic product is our measure of production, but it is by no means a perfect measure of production, and I'll never argue that it is. It has quite a few drawbacks and limitations that we just kind of have to deal with when we are comparing GDP across time. One of which is that it excludes non-market production. And non-market production is anything that you produce or create by yourself at home that you don't trade uh, for on the marketplace. So for example, if you uh, um, do your own gardening and you create your own garden at home, right? that is an example of non-market production. If you hire a gardener to come in and produce that same garden and pay them for it, that is now a transaction that's happening on the marketplace. That's something that gardener is going to that is that is something that that gardener is going to declare on their tax returns, and so that is something that will then be added to GDP. So this leaves a lot of room for some weird stuff to happen. So for example, if you're somebody who does your own gardening, that doesn't get added to GDP. If you hire somebody to do your gardening for you, right, then that will be added to GDP, even though it's the same garden that is being produced. So if you hire a gardener to come in and create your garden, then that's going to increase GDP. Now, if during the course of the year, you fall in love with and marry your gardener, so they now do your gardening for free, then that's going to make GDP go down, even though they're doing this, they're producing the same garden that they were producing before, right? So again, if you watch your own kids, that's not going to be included into uh, GDP anywhere. If you pay a babysitter to come in and watch your kids for you, then that's going to add to GDP, which means that now that we're living in an age where there are a lot more uh, women in the workplace than there were ever before, and you have a lot of dual income families who are now paying people to come in and say, do their laundry, clean their house, or wash their kids, and that's going to increase GDP in a couple of ways. One of which is that, again, you now have two parents in the workplace earning money, so that's uh, more market production that's happening. And then when they hire somebody to come in and do those household chores, that people used to do on their own, that's also going to increase GDP, even though they're the same household chores are being performed now as they're being performed before. They're just being performed by somebody that you are paying to do it on the marketplace. Right? So again, when we talk about non-market production, we're talking about doing things for yourself. Right? If you fix up your own car, right? again, that's not going to get added to GDP anywhere uh, because you're doing that work yourself. You're not paying somebody to do it in the marketplace. Again, if you hire a mechanic to come in and fix up your car for you, then that is going to add to GDP. If you, again, you fall in love with a marry your mechanic so that they fix up your car for free now, then that would subtract from GDP even though the same car is being fixed. So again, it's kind of hard to compare GDP across time given that it does exclude this non-market production. Some countries, particularly those developing countries, uh, people do more household chores themselves rather than hire somebody to do it. So that's gonna make their GDP appear a lot lower. Uh, than when, say, in a country like the United States or a more developed country, we hire somebody to do those household chores for us. Right? So it might also be hard to compare GDP across countries, given that it excludes non-market production. Something that is similar to but different than non-market production is it excludes the underground economy. 
In the underground economy are transactions that are happening. So you are paying somebody to perform a, uh, a service or to produce a good, right? But those transactions are just not being recorded anywhere, right? Now this could be because those transactions are illegal. So if you go down to your favorite drug dealer and buy yourself some crack, right? That is a transaction that is happening on the marketplace. You are paying for a good that is being produced, right? But again, you're probably not going to record that anywhere. And your drug dealer certainly isn't going to record that on their tax returns anywhere. So again, that's not going to get added to GDP just because nobody knows it's happening, right? If you go and visit your favorite prostitute and receive an hour's worth of prostitution services, right? Again, because in most places in the United States, that is an illegal transaction. That's probably not going to be recorded anywhere, even though you are paying somebody for a service, right? So this counts as part of the underground economy. And again, it would not be included into GDP, even though uh, money is being exchanged and goods and services are being created and performed, right? Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be an illegal transaction. It could be a legal transaction that just goes undeclared or unreported. For example, if you are a waiter or waitress and you don't declare all your tips, you kind of keep that hidden from the government, then again, that wouldn't be included into GDP just because nobody would know about it, even though it is a transaction that is taking place uh, on the marketplace uh, it, it is a, a good or service that is being performed and paid for. Uh, same thing if you are a taxi driver who doesn't necessarily declare all of your uh, uh, tips, right? Then again, that wouldn't be included in GDP either and be part of the underground economy. And as it turns out, that underground economy is quite sizable, right? It usually comes out to about 10 to 15% of GDP, meaning that GDP would be 10 to 15% higher if we were able to record these uh, uh, transactions that are going unrecorded for whatever reason. So just uh, before we move on to number three, just to make sure that we're clear. So a um, transaction that takes place in the underground economy is a transaction that does involve, again, a, a good or service being performed and money changing hands. It's just not recorded. A uh, example of non-market production is where you're doing something yourself Right, oh, and that's not necessarily uh, involving anybody else coming in and receiving money for it. Right, so again, non-market production is you doing it yourself. Uh, underground economy is uh, you uh, participating in a voluntary exchange, getting a good or service that you're paying for. It's just not being recorded anywhere. So let's move on to number three. Number three is excludes leisure and human costs. And what we mean by this is that if we're really trying to measure production, as an uh, example of measuring maybe how good things have gotten or our quality of life, one problem with GDP is it excludes the pace at which this production is happening. So it measures production, but it doesn't necessarily measure things like your free time. So, for example, if we can produce even more today in less time, all GDP accounts for is how much we're producing, not how much less time we are producing it in. Right, so if you could say produce the exact same amount uh, today in eight hours as you could say 20 years ago in 12 hours, then you have four more hours of leisure time. That's certainly an indication of you being more productive that you can produce the exact same amount in less time, but GDP only measures what's produced, again, not how much leisure time you have after producing it. Right, so again, it doesn't measure for the, it doesn't account for the fact that things are being produced a lot more quickly today and that we have a lot more leisure time today than we did, say, years ago. It also excludes what we call human costs, which is the safety of that production. So, for example, again, if you're producing the same amount today as you were in 1940, but things are a lot safer today, GDP doesn't account for that increased safety, right? In other words, if you have a lot fewer arms being ripped off by machines nowadays than you did in, say, 1950, GDP doesn't account for that. It just counts for what's being produced not the safety of the workers during that production. And maybe that is something that we should try to factor in at some point when we're talking about our measures of productivity. The fact that we can produce as much today as we could say 50 years ago, we can, also, we can just do it faster and more safely in the case that we are a more productive economy, but it won't be included into GDP anywhere. So again, GDP kind of understates our level of productivity when it doesn't take into account the fact that we are producing things quick, more quickly and safer. GDP also has difficulty measuring the quality variation and introduction of new goods. So, for example, if a car is produced in 1950 and sold for 
then that's going to add the exact same amount to 1950s GDP as a car that is produced in, say, the year 2020 and sold for $20,000. Uh, that's going to add the exact same amount to the year 2020's GDP. So in both cases, it's a uh, car that's being produced and sold for, uh, for uh, $20,000. So in both cases, it's going to add $20,000 to that year's GDP. However, the car being produced in 2020 certainly is a lot better and higher quality than the car that was produced in 2050. Cars today have things like uh, anti-lock brakes, power steering, built-in seat belts. It's got um, USB ports so that you can listen to your digital music while driving. It's got, often got GPS uh, systems. Sometimes it's got uh, television sets and the headrests. Right? There's all kinds of great things that cars have today that cars in 1950 couldn't even have dreamed of. And yet they're going to add the exact same amount to GDP if they're produced for the exact same selling price. So again, comparing GDP across time has difficulty measuring or uh, accounting for those quality variations. Also, there's new goods that exist now that didn't exist in previous time periods. And it is hard to uh, kind of track production over time while simultaneously including these new goods. For example, the uh, smartphones that you have today didn't exist, say, uh, 20 or 30 years ago. And as a result, certainly uh, cell phones have changed over the years in such a way that's a completely new product. But again, GDP doesn't necessarily account for how great the phone is, just again, uh, what it's produced for or its selling price. And the fifth and final one is that GDP excludes the cost of disasters and harmful side effects of production. And what we mean by that is if, say, a uh, hurricane were to come through and destroy a particular area and we go in and rebuild it, the rebuilding will add to GDP, but again, we haven't really subtracted anything from GDP as a result of that hurricane or natural disaster. And so what that means is that GDP is going to look at least a little inflated by the fact that we came in and we rebuilt it, all the stuff that was destroyed by the natural disaster. But in reality, we just have what we had before. So we don't necessarily have more stuff, or we haven't produced additional stuff over what we had before. We just rebuilt what was destroyed. But um, because uh, that rebuilding counts as production, then GDP is going to look higher than maybe what it should, right? And what we mean by harmful side effects of production includes things like uh, pollution. So, for example, if we produce the exact same amount of stuff, but we also produce a lot of pollution with it, then maybe we could uh, – maybe that pollution should subtract from our levels of productivity or our GDP, but it certainly doesn't. So if we were to produce a, a lot of uh, – there's the exact same amount of stuff, but produce it in a lot cleaner way so that it doesn't add as much pollution, then again, GDP is going to have the same number as when we pr produce stuff but cause all that pollution in addition to it, right? So uh, whether we produce things uh, more cleanly or whether we produce things that have a lot of pollution, either way, GDP is going to be the same number. So again, GDP doesn't necessarily account for any harmful side effects of production like pollution, and maybe it should if we're trying to really get across how productive – our uh, economy or society is right so these are some limitations of GDP make sure you understand what they are so that you can uh, pick them out or answer questions about them on the quiz or exam right so here's an example of a question like this uh, like the, you might see on the quiz or exam so it says if waitresses and taxi drivers do not report all of their income to the government GDP will be understated this is because this unreported income is it a involves the introduction of new goods is it B as part of the underground economy? Is it C an example of non-market production? Or D represents an increase in leisure time? And the idea here is that these waitresses and taxi drivers are uh, providing a service and they are being paid for that service on the marketplace. They are just not recording or reporting all of it. That makes this a part of the underground economy. Again, this isn't a uh, non-market uh, transaction here or non-market production. Non-market production would be if you say drove yourself to, a, uh, to work or school rather than pay the taxi driver to do it, right? Again, underground economy is when you do pay somebody to do it, it's just not being reported or declared for whatever reason, right? All right, so continuing on here, the final thing that we're going to talk about in this particular chapter is this idea of per capita GDP, which is just GDP divided by population or GDP per person. So this, amounts, so this uh, uh, equals the amount of production we have per individual in the economy. And this, is, as it turns out, is a much more representative measure of our uh, living standards in a particular country. So countries with higher per capita GDP 
or countries that tend to have higher living standards or are countries in which you'd most uh, rather live, right? So when we talked about those uh, uh, countries in chapter two that had higher uh, levels of economic freedom and how those countries had higher levels of per capita GDP, what we mean is that they had higher levels of production per person and therefore higher living standards or again, are countries that you probably more rather want to live in. So let's go through a quick example here of how to calculate this and what that calculation represents. So it's called a tale of two countries here. We've got two countries, country A and country B. Again, I'm going to go ahead and exit the uh, full screen mode so we can use our different colors. So if we're looking at country A, if we want to calculate our GDP per capita, or I'm sorry, uh, per capita GDP, although it does mean the same thing. Let's go ahead and just keep the terminology consistent. So we're measuring our per capita GDP. And some textbooks might call it GDP per capita. Either way, it's the same thing. Let's go ahead and stick with per capita GDP here. Right, if we're trying to calculate that for country A, then again, we just calculate the uh, GDP divided by the population. So we have a GDP of $1,000 divided over the 10 people in that economy. That means that the country is producing about $100 per person, right? Now, our per capita GDP for country B is going to look something like this. You're going to have a total of $1,000 in GDP. So notice that the GDP for the two countries are exactly the same. However, you have 100 people generating that $1,000 in country B, whereas you only had 10 people generating that $1,000 in country A. Right, so our per capita GDP for country B turns out to be just $10 per person. So even though that both countries have the exact same GDP or total amount of production, country A has a much higher uh, uh, GDP per capita than country B. And so the living standards throughout country A on average are going to be higher than living standards throughout country B on average. Right, so for example, uh, country A could be like the United States whereas country B might be like China, right? They might have similar GDPs, but the United States has far fewer people producing that GDP, whereas China has far more people producing that GDP. And so the average living standards of individuals within the United States in terms of what they have access to and uh, what they can produce and afford are gonna be higher than the average living standards throughout China, right? So again, the higher the per capita GDP, generally speaking, the higher the living standards of the individuals within these countries. All right, so again, that's how you calculate per capita GDP, and that is what that calculation represents. All right, generally when we say a country is developed, those are countries that have higher per capita GDP. When we say a country is developing, right, those are countries with lower per capita GDP. All right, so that is it for chapter seven. Please know the definition for GDP, right? It is the market value of all final goods and services produced within a country during a specific period. Know what we mean by market value or converting them all into a dollar amount. Know what we mean by final goods and services. Remember, those are those that are consumed by the ultimate user. We don't count those intermediate goods or, they, or we'd be double counting some stuff. Right? Know what we mean by produced. Remember, transfers aren't uh, counted in the GDP. Only things that are being produced within that current uh, time period are. Know what we mean by within a country. It has to happen within the geographic borders of a country to be included into GDP. And then know what we mean by during a specific period, it has to be, be, it has to, uh, be produced during the time period uh, being examined in order to be included into that time period's GDP. So know which transactions are included in GDP and which ones are not based on that definition. Know the four components of the expenditure approach and how to calculate each one. Right, remember, you have consumption, which is your durable goods, your non-durable goods, and your services. You have your uh, inventory, or sorry, you have your investment component, which is your business fixed investment plus your inventory investment, which is uh, again calculated as ending inventory minus beginning inventory. You have your government expenditures or G, right? Remember that that includes the goods and services that the government uh, purchases, right? At market value, uh, or sorry, uh, it's included at the uh, cost to the taxpayers rather than the value added. Now remember with government expenditures, it does not include transfers. So it does not include things like uh, welfare payments, does not include things like uh, unemployment benefits, and it does not include things like social security payments. So again, when you take money from one group of people to give to another group of people, that's a transfer. Nothing's being produced right now to get that money, 
So that's not being included into GDP anywhere. And then finally, net exports is the fourth and final component of the expenditure approach. That is exports minus imports. If imports are greater than exports, which is usually the case in the United States, then that uh, uh, fourth component could be negative, indicating that it subtracts from GDP. Uh, know the definition for gross national product. That is the market value of all final goods and services produced by the citizens of a country during a specific period, no matter uh, where those citizens are. Right. So again, if it's a U.S. citizen, then that gets added to U.S. GNP, no matter which country they are uh, doing that production. Uh, be able to calculate a price index and a real value. Remember, the price index is the cost of a market basket of goods divided by the cost of that same bundle in the base year. And then a real value is equal to the nominal value multiplied by the price index in the year you're converting to divided by the price index in the year you're converting from. Now those limitations of GDP that we just talked about, remember that it excludes that non-market production or things that you're doing for yourself where no transactions taking place. It also excludes the underground economy. That is a situation where a transaction is taking place. It's just not being declared or reported. It excludes those leisure or uh, human costs, right? So it doesn't account for the fact that production might be uh, faster and safer than it was before. It also excludes the uh, uh, difference in... Uh, uh, product quality, right? So it doesn't account for the fact that cars being produced today are a lot nicer than the cars that are being produced for the same price 30 or 40 years ago. And of course, it also doesn't include uh, new goods. So it doesn't take into account the fact that our cell phones today are entirely different products that can do a lot more than cell phones could years ago. And finally, remember that it does exclude the uh, uh, cost of disasters and the harmful and any harmful side effects of production. So if a natural disaster comes through and destroys an area, that won't subtract from GDP, but the rebuilding will add to it, making it look like GDP exploded, even though we're just putting back what was there before. And then finally, again, any pollution that we produce as a byproduct of our production doesn't subtract from GDP. So if we start producing things in a lot more economic, or sorry, a lot more environmentally friendly way, again, that won't necessarily make us more productive or increase our measure of GDP, even though maybe it should. And then finally, be able to calculate per capita GDP. That is just GDP divided by the population or GDP per person and know what it represents. The higher that per capita GDP, the higher the living standards of that particular uh, country. All right. So with that in mind, that is uh, it for Chapter 7. As always, just let me know if you need anything. Feel free to email me or come visit me in those Zoom office hours, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. All right, so until next time, please stay safe and healthy. Take care of yourselves. And once again, let me know if there's anything I can do for you.